Welcome to the reading of the 50th Law by 50 Cent and Robert Greene. Chapter 5 Know when to be bad. Aggression You will always find yourself among the aggressive and the passive aggressive who seek to harm you in some way. You must get over any general fears you have of confronting people or you will find it extremely difficult to assert yourself in the face of those who are more cunning and ruthless. Before it is too late, you must master the art of knowing when and how to be bad. Using deception, manipulation, and outright force at the appropriate moments, everyone operates with a flexible morality when it comes to their self-interest. You are simply making this more conscious and effective. The Hustler's Setup The Hustler's every waking hour is lived with both the practical and the subconscious knowledge that if he ever relaxes, if he ever slows down, the other hungry restless foxes, ferrets, wolves, and vultures out there with him won't hesitate to make him their prey. Malcolm X. In the summer of 1994, Curtis Jackson returned to Southside Queens after having served some time in a rehabilitation program for drug offenders. And to his surprise, in the year he had been away, the hustling game had dramatically changed. The streets were now more crowded than ever with dealers trying to make some money in the crack cocaine trade. Having grown weary over the heated robberies and violence of the past eight years, the hustlers had settled into a system where each would have his own corner or two. The drug fiends would come to them for quick transactions. It was easy predictable for everyone. No need to fight or push people out of the way or even move around. Curtis spread the word that he was looking to get his old crew together and start back where he had left off before rehab. He was met with suspicion and outright hostility. He could ruin the nice system they had in place with his ambitious hustling schemes. He had the feeling they would kill him before he could do anything just to preserve this new order. The future suddenly seemed depressing and grim. He had decided months before to find a way out of the drug dealing racket, but his plans depended on his ability to make some good money and save it so he could segue into a music career. Fitting into this one corner system would mean he could never earn enough a few years would go by and he would find it harder and harder to get out. But if he made a play to grab more turf and make some quick money, he would find few allies and many enemies among his fellow hustlers. It was not in their interest that he be allowed to expand his business. The more Curtis pondered the situation, the angrier he became. It seemed to him that everywhere he turned, People were trying to get in his way, restrain his ambitions, or tell him what to do. They pretended they were trying to keep order, when in fact it was just about getting power for themselves and holding on to it. In his experience, whenever he wanted something in life, he couldn't afford to be nice and submissive. He had to get active and forceful. It would be natural for him to feel a little skittish coming fresh out of jail and trying to get his old life back together. But what he really had to be afraid of was being stuck and settling for the corner hustler's life. Now was exactly the time to get aggressive, to be bad and to disrupt this system that was designed only to keep people like him down. He thought back to the great hustlers he had known in the neighborhood. One of their most successful strategies was the setup, a variation on the old con game of bait and switch. 
You distract people with something dramatic and emotional. And while they are not paying attention to you, you grab what you want. He had seen it executed dozens of times. And as he thought about it, he realized that he had the material for the perfect distraction. While in rehab, he had befriended the ringleader of a gang of Brooklyn stick-up artists. They were notorious for their efficiency and intimidating presence. For the setup, Curtis would lay low for a few weeks, working a corner like everyone else and appearing to go along with the new system. He would then hire these stick-up artists on the side to rob all of the neighborhood hustlers, including Curtis himself, of their jewelry, money, and drugs. Nobody would suspect his involvement. In the weeks to come, he watched with amusement as the sudden appearance of the stick-up artist in his neighborhood caused panic among the hustlers, some of whom were his friends. He pretended to share their distress. These Brooklyn gangsters were not to be messed with. Almost overnight, the dealers whole way of life was disrupted. They were forced now to carry guns for protection, but this created a new set of problems. The police were everywhere, making random checks, and to be caught loitering with a gun would mean solid prison time. The hustlers could no longer simply stand on a street corner and wait for the drug fiends to come to them. They had to keep in constant motion to avoid the police. For some, Getting called on their beepers was the only way to arrange a deal. Everything became more complicated and business slowed down. The old model, tight and static, had been exploded and now Curtis moved into the breach with some new colored capsules he packaged and sold to the fiends. Sometimes he included in the sales some free capsules which happened to be the drugs he had accumulated from the robberies. The fiends began to flock to him, while the other hustlers were too upset to notice the trick that had been played. By the time they had figured it out, it was too late. Curtis had expanded his business and he was well on his way to buying his freedom. Several years later, Curtis, now known as 50 Cent, had carved out a path towards a career as a rapper. He had a deal with Columbia Records and the future looked reasonably bright, but 50 was not one to be duped by the usual dreams. He quickly saw that there was only so much room for the top performers who could bank on a solid career in the business. He, along with everyone else, was fighting for crumbs of attention. The artist might get temporary success with a hit here, or there, but it wouldn't last. And they had no power to alter the dynamic. What was worse, 50 had made some enemies in the business. He was an ambitious hustler with talent. There were people who mistrusted and feared him. They worked behind the scenes to make sure he would not get far in the industry. As 50 had learned, talent and good intentions are never enough in this world. You need to be fearless and strategic. When you face people's indifference or outright hostility, you have to get aggressive and push them out of your way by any means necessary and not worry about some people disliking you. In this case, he looked for any opportunity to make such a bold move. And one evening, a chance encounter provided this for him. At a club in Manhattan, 50 was talking with a friend from the neighborhood when he saw the rapper Ja Rule staring in his direction. Several weeks before, 50's friend had robbed Ja Rule of some jewelry in broad daylight. 50 expected Ja to come over and cause some trouble. Instead, he looked away and decided to ignore them. This was rather shocking. Ja Rule was then one of the hottest rappers in the business. He had built his reputation on being a gangster from Southside Queens. His lyrics reflecting his tough guy image. He and his record label, Murder Inc. 
had allied themselves with Kenneth Supreme McGriff, former head of the Supreme Team, a gang that had dominated the New York drug business in the 1980s with its ruthless tactics. Supreme gave them street credibility, and Murder, Inc. gave Supreme an entree into the music business, something legitimate to distance himself from his dark past. No real hustler or gangster would ever ignore the man who had robbed him so brazenly. What this meant to 50 was that Ja was fake. His lyrics and image, all a show to make money. He was arrogant, yet insecure. As he contemplated this, the idea for a masterful setup took shape in his mind. One that would draw attention and help catapult him past all of those who stood in his way. In the weeks to come, 50 began releasing diss tracks that took aim at Ja Rule, painting him as a studio gangster who rapped about things that he had never experienced. Ja must have been annoyed, but he did not respond to 50's taunts. He was clearly too big to concern himself with small fry. 50's next move, however, could not be ignored. He released a song that detailed the activities of the most notorious gang leaders, including Supreme, in Southside Queens in the 1980s. As the song became popular on the streets, it brought Supreme the kind of attention he was trying to avoid now that he was going legitimate. This made him angry and suspicious. What might 50 do next? He pressured Ja Rule to go after and destroy this upstart before he went too far. Ja was now forced into going after him. He tried whatever he could to shut 50 up. He spread nasty rumors about 50's past and attempted to block any record deals he might have. At one point, Finding 50 in the same recording studio he was at, Ja and his cohorts started a brawl. Ja wanted to intimidate 50 with his muscle and reputation, but this only made 50 increase the pace of diss tracks that he released. He wanted to push all of Ja's buttons, make him angry and insecure, burning for revenge. He'd stay cool and strategic while Ja would lose control. To this purpose, he called Ja a wankster, a wannabe gangster. He parodied his singing style, his lyrics, everything about his supposed tough guy image. The songs were hard driving, biting, and humorous. Slowly but surely, Ja became more and more furious as these songs made it to the radio and journalists peppered him with questions about 50. He had to prove his toughness, that he was no wankster, so he released his own diss tracks. These songs were not witty, however, only violent and vicious. Without realizing it, he had become defensive and not very entertaining. 50's first record came out about the same time as one of Jaws, and its sales far eclipsed those of his rivals. Now he was the star, and Ja began to fade from the scene. Befitting his new role, 50 stopped the attacks, almost out of pity for his former rival. Ja had served his purpose, and it was better to leave him to oblivion. The fearless approach. The way I learned it, the kid in the schoolyard who doesn't want to fight always leaves with a black eye. If you indicate you'll do anything to avoid trouble, that's when you get trouble. 50 cent. Life involves constant battle and confrontation. This comes on two levels. On one level, we have desires and needs, our own interests that we wish to advance. In a highly competitive world, 
This means we must assert ourselves and even occasionally push people out of position to get our way. On the other level, there are always people who are more aggressive than we are. At some point they cross our path and try to block or harm us. On both levels, playing offense and defense, we have to manage people's resistance and hostility. This has been the human drama since the beginning of history, and no amount of progress will alter this dynamic. The only thing that has changed is how we handle these inevitable moments of friction in our lives. In the past, people had a greater taste for battle. We can read signs of this in all kinds of social behavior. At the theater, for instance, it was common practice for 19th century audiences in Europe and America to verbally express their disapproval of the actors or the play. Yelling, hissing, or throwing things onto the stage. Fights would often break out in the theater over differences of opinion. It was not cause for concern, but part of the appeal. In political campaigns, it was accepted as normal that partisans of various parties would confront each other in the streets over their divergent interests. Democracy was considered vibrant by allowing such public disagreements, a kind of safety valve for human aggression. Now, we tend to find the opposite. We are generally much more skittish when it comes to confrontation. We often take it personally if someone overtly disagrees with us or expresses an opinion contrary to our own. We are also more afraid of saying something that could possibly offend those around us as if their egos were too fragile. The culture tends to elevate as its ideal a spirit of cooperation. Being democratic and fair means getting along with others fitting in and not ruffling feathers. Conflict and friction are almost evil. We are encouraged to be differential and agreeable. Nevertheless, the human animal retains its aggressive impulses and all that happens is that many people channel this energy into passive aggressive behavior, which makes everything more complicated. In such an atmosphere, we all pay a price. When it comes to the offensive side of power, in which we are required to take forceful and necessary action to advance our interests, we are often hesitant and uncertain. When dealing with the aggressors and passive aggressors around us, we can be quite naive. We want to believe that people are basically peaceful and desire the same things as ourselves. We often learn too late that this is not the case. This inability to deal with what is inevitable in life is the cause of so many problems. We work to postpone or avoid conflicts. And when they reach a point where we can no longer play such a passive game, we lack the experience and the habit of meeting them head on. The first step in overcoming this is to realize that the ability to deal with conflict is a function of inner strength versus fear, and that it has nothing to do with goodness or badness. When you feel weak and afraid, you have the sense that you cannot handle any kind of confrontation. You might fall apart or lose control or get hurt. Better to keep everything smooth and even your main goal, then, is to be liked, which becomes a kind of defensive shield. So much of what passes for good and nice behavior is really a reflection of deep fears. What you want instead is to feel secure and strong from within. You are willing to occasionally displease people and you are comfortable in taking on those who stand against your interests. From such a position of strength, you are able to handle friction in an effective manner, being bad when it is appropriate. This inner strength, however, does not come naturally. What is required is some experience. This means that in your daily life, you must assert yourself more than usual. You take on an aggressor instead of avoiding him. 
You strategize and push for something you want instead of waiting for someone to give it to you. You will generally notice that your fears have exaggerated the consequences of this kind of behavior. You are sending signals to others that you have limits they cannot cross, that you have interests you are willing to defend or advance. You will find yourself getting rid of this constant anxiety about confronting people. You are no longer tied to this false niceness that wears on your nerves. The next battle will be easier. Your confidence in handling such moments of friction will grow with each encounter. In the hood, people don't have the luxury of worrying about whether people like them. Resources are limited. Everyone is angling for power and trying to get what they can. It is a rough game. And there is no room for being naive or waiting for good things to happen. You learn to take what you need and feel no guilt about it. If you have dreams and ambitions, you know that to realize them, you have to get active, make some noise, bruise a few people in your path, and you expect others to do the same to you. It is human nature, and instead of complaining, you simply must get better at protecting yourself. We all face a similar competitive dynamic because people all around us are struggling to advance their interests. But because our fights are more subtle and feel, we tend to lose sight of the harsh aspects of the game. We are often too trusting in others. In a future that will bring good things, we could use some of the toughness and realism that people who grow up in pressurized environments have. A simple line can be drawn. We all have ambitions and large goals for ourselves. We are either waiting for some perfect moment to realize them or we are taking action in the present. This action requires some aggressive energy channeled in a smart manner and the willingness to displease a person or two who gets in our way. If we are waiting and settling for what we have, it is not because we are good and nice but because we are fearful. We need to get rid of the fear and guilt we might have for asserting ourselves. It serves no purpose except to keep us down. The fearless types in history have often had to face a lot of hostility in their lives. And in doing so, they invariably discover the critical role that one's attitude plays in thwarting people's aggression. Look at Richard Wright, the first best-selling African-American writer in US history. His father abandoned his mother shortly after Wright's birth in 1908 and Wright knew only poverty and starvation as a child. His uncle, with whom they lived, was lynched by a white mob. And his family, Wright and his mother and brother, were forced to flee from Arkansas and wander across the South. When his mother fell ill and became an invalid, he was shunted from family to family, even spending time in an orphanage. Family members who took him in themselves, poor and frustrated, beat him incessantly. His classmates at school, sensing he was different, he liked to read books and was shy. They taunted and ostracized him. At work, his white employer subjected him to endless indignities such as beatings and dismissals from the job for no apparent reason. These experiences created in him intricate layers of fear. But as he read more books about the wider world and thought more deeply, a different spirit rose inside of him. A need to rebel and not accept the status quo. When an uncle threatened to beat him over a trivialty, he decided he had had enough. Although just a child, he clutched two razor blades in his hands and told the uncle he was prepared to go down fighting. He was never bothered by that uncle again. Seeing the power he had with such an attitude, he now made it something more calculated and under control. When conditions at work became impossible, he would leave the job, a sign of impertinence to the white employers who spread word of this around town. 
He didn't care if people thought he was different. He was proud of it. Feeling like he was going to be trapped in Jackson, Mississippi for the rest of his life and yearning to escape to the North, he became a criminal for the first and last time in his life. Stealing enough to pay his way out of town, he felt more than justified in doing this. This spirit permeated his life to the very end. As a successful writer now living in Chicago, he felt that his novels were being misread by the white public. They invariably found a way to soften his message about racial prejudices to see what they wanted to see in his work. He realized he had been holding back, tailoring his words to appeal to them. He had to rise again above this fear of pleasing others and write a book that could not be misread. That would be as bleak as the life he had known. This became Native Son, his most famous and successful novel. What Wright had discovered was simple. When you submit in spirit to aggressors or to an unjust and impossible situation, you do not buy yourself any real peace. You encourage people to go further, to take more from you, to use you for their own purposes. They sense your lack of self-respect and they feel justified in mistreating you. When you are humble, you reap the wages of humility. You must develop the opposite of fighting stance that comes from deep within and cannot be shaken. You force some respect. This is how it is in life for everyone. People will take from you what they can. If they sense that you are the type of person who accepts and submits, they will push and push until they have established an exploitative relationship with you. Some will do this overtly. Others are more slippery and passive aggressive. You must demonstrate to them that there are lines that cannot be crossed. They will pay a price for trying to push you around. This comes from your attitude, fearless and always prepared to fight. It radiates outward and can be read in your manner without you having to speak a word. By a paradoxical law of human nature, trying to please people less will make them more likely in the long run to respect and treat you better. Keys to fearlessness for how we live is so far removed from how we ought to live that he who abandons what is done for what ought to be done will rather learn to bring about his own ruin than his preservation. A man who wishes to make a profession of goodness in everything must necessarily come to grief among so many who are not good. Therefore, it is necessary for a prince who wishes to maintain himself, to learn how not to be good, and to use this knowledge and not use it according to the necessity of the case. Nicola Machiavelli. When it comes to morality, almost all of us experience a split in our consciousness on one hand, we understand the need to follow certain basic codes of behavior that have been in place for centuries. We try our best to live by them. On the other hand, we also sense that the world has become infinitely more competitive than anything our parents or grandparents have known. To get ahead in this world, we must be willing to occasionally bend that moral code to play with appearances to hedge the truth and make ourselves look better, to manipulate a person or two to secure our position. The culture at large reflects this division. It emphasizes values of cooperation and decency while titillating us constantly in the media with endless stories of those who have risen to the top by being bad and ruthless. We are both drawn to and repulsed by these stories. 
This split creates an ambivalence and awkwardness in our actions. We are not very good at being either good or bad. When we do the manipulative acts that are necessary, it is with half a heart and some guilt. We are not sure how to operate in this way, when to play the more aggressive role, or how far to go. The great 16th century Florentine writer Nicola Machiavelli noticed a similar phenomenon in his day on a different level. Italy had splintered into several city-states that were constantly intriguing for power. It was a dangerous, complicated environment for a leader. In facing a rival state, a prince had to be extremely careful. He knew that these rivals would do anything to advance their interests, including cutting deals with others to isolate or destroy him. He had to be ready to attempt any kind of maneuver to protect his state. At the same time, he was imbued with Christian values. He had to juggle two codes of behavior, one for private life and another for the game of power. This made for awkwardness. Nobody really defined the moral parameters for how to defend and advance his state. If he became too aggressive, he would look bad on the world stage and suffer for it. If he was too good and gentle, his state could be overrun by a rival, bringing misery for his citizenry. For Machiavelli, the problem wasn't a leader adjusting his morality to the circumstance. Everyone does that. It was that he did not do it well. Too often he would be aggressive when he needed to be cunning or vice versa. He would not recognize in time the once friendly state that was now plotting against him and his response would be too desperate. When a venture succeeds, people tend to overlook some of the nasty tactics you were forced to use. When a venture fails, those same tactics become scrutinized and condemned. A prince or leader must first and foremost be effective in his actions and to do so he must master the art of knowing when and how to be bad. This requires some fearlessness and flexibility. When the situation calls for it, he must be the lion, aggressive and direct in protecting his state or grabbing something to secure its interests. At other times, he has to be the fox, getting his way through crafty maneuvers that disguise his aggression. And often, he must play the lamb, the meek, deferential, and good creature exalted in culture. He is bad in the right way, calibrated to the situation, and careful to make his actions look justified to the public reserving his nastier tactics for behind the scenes. If he masters the art of being bad, he uses it sparingly and he creates more peace and power for his citizens than the awkward prince who tries to be too good. This model should be the model for us as well. We are all now princes competing with thousands of rival states. We have our aggressive impulses, our desires for power. These impulses are dangerous. If we act upon them unconsciously or awkwardly, we can create endless problems for ourselves. We must learn to recognize the situations that require assertive yet controlled actions and which mode of attack, fox or lion is suitable. The following are the most common foes and scenarios that you will encounter in which some form of badness is required to defend or advance yourself. Aggressors. By 1935, there were some on the left in the United States who had grown discontented with President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's reforms, known as the New Deal. They believed these reforms were not working fast enough. 
they decided to band together to form what would later be known as the Union Party to galvanize this discontent. They were going to run against FDR in 1936, and the threat was very real that they would gain enough support to throw the election to the Republicans. Within this group was Huey Long, the great populist senator from Louisiana and Father Charles Coughlin, the Catholic priest who had a popular radio program. Their ideas were vaguely socialistic and appealed to many who felt disenfranchised during the Great Depression. Their attacks on FDR began to have effect. His poll numbers went down. Feeling emboldened, they became even more aggressive and relentless in their campaign. In the midst of this, FDR remained mostly silent, letting them fill the air with their charges and threats. His advisors panicked. They felt he was being too passive. But for Roosevelt, it was part of the plan. He felt certain that the public would grow tired of their shrill attacks as the months went on. He sensed that the factions within the Union Party would begin to fight among themselves as the election neared. He ordered his surrogates to not attack these men. At the same time, he went to work behind the scenes. In Louisiana, he fired as many long supporters working for the government as possible and replaced them with those on his side. He launched detailed investigations into the senator's dubious financial affairs. With Coughlin, he worked to isolate him from other notable Catholic priests, making him look like a fringe radical. He introduced laws that forced Coughlin to get an operating permit to broadcast his shows. The government found reasons to deny his request and temporarily silenced him. All of this served to confuse and frighten FDR's foes. As he had predicted, the party began to splinter and the public lost interest. Roosevelt won the 1936 election in an unprecedented landslide. FDR had understood the basic principle in squaring off against aggressors who are direct and relentless. If you meet them head on, you are forced to fight on their terms. Unless you happen to be an aggressive type, you are generally at a disadvantage against those who have simple ideas and fierce energy. It is best to fight them in an indirect manner, concealing your intentions and doing what you can behind the scenes, hidden from the public, to create obstacles and sow confusion. Instead of reacting, you must give aggressors some space to go further with their attacks, getting them to expose themselves in the process and provide you plenty of juicy targets to hit. If you become too active and forceful in response, you look defensive. You are playing the fox to their lion, remaining cool and calculating, doing whatever you can to make them more emotional and baiting them to fall apart through their own reckless energy. Passive Aggressors These types are masters at disguise. They present themselves as weak and helpless or highly moral and righteous or friendly and ingratiating. This makes them hard to pick out at first glance. They send all kinds of mixed signals, alternating between friendly, cool, and hostile, creating confusion and conflicting emotions. If you try to call them on their behavior, they use this confusion to make you feel guilty, as if you were the one who was the source of the problem. Once you are drawn into their dramas, with your emotions engaged, it can be very difficult to detach yourself. The key is recognizing them in time to take appropriate action. When the Grand Duchess Catherine, future Empress of Russia, Catherine the Great, met her husband-to-be Peter, she felt he was an innocent child at heart. He continued to play with toy soldiers and had a petulant, moody temperament. Then shortly after their marriage in 1745, she began to detect a different side to his character. In private, they got along well enough. 
But then she would hear from secondhand sources all kinds of nasty stories about how he had regretted their marriage and how he preferred her chambermaid. What was she to believe? These stories or his geniality when they were together? After he became Tsar Peter III, he would graciously invite Catherine to visit him in the morning, but then he would ignore her. When the royal gardener stopped delivering her favorite fruits, she found out it was on his orders. Peter was doing everything he could to make her life miserable and humiliate her in subtle ways. Fortunately, Catherine figured out early on that he was a master manipulator. His childish exterior was clearly there to distract attention from his petty, vindictive core. His goal, she believed, was to bait her into doing something rash that would give him an excuse to isolate or get rid of her. She decided to bide her time, be as gracious as possible, and win over some key allies in the court and the military, many of whom had come to despise the Tsar. Finally, certain of her allies' support, she instigated a coup that would get rid of him once and for all. When it became clear that the military had sided with Catherine and that he was to be arrested, Peter started to beg and plead with her. He would change his ways and they would rule together. She did not reply. She sent another message saying he would abdicate if only he could return peacefully to his own estate with his mistress. She refused to bargain. He was arrested and soon thereafter murdered by one of the coup intriguers, perhaps with the approval of the Empress. Catherine was a classic fearless type. She understood that with passive aggressors, you must not get emotional and drawn into their endless intrigues. If you respond indirectly with a kind of passive aggression yourself, you play into their hands. They are better at this game than you are being underhanded and tricky only spurs on their insecurities and intensifies their vindictive nature. The only way to treat these types is to take bold, uncompromising action that either discourages further nonsense or sends them running away. They respond only to power and leverage. Having allies higher up the chain can serve as a means of blocking them. You are playing the lion to their fox, making them afraid of you. They see there will be real consequences if they continue their behavior in any form. To recognize such types, look for extremes in behavior that are not natural, too kind, too ingratiating, too moral, these are most likely disguises that are worn to deflect attention from their true nature. Better to be proactive and take precautionary measures the moment you feel they are trying to get into your life. Unjust Situations Sometime in the early 1850s, Abraham Lincoln came to the conclusion that the institution of slavery was the great stain on our democracy and had to be eliminated. But as he surveyed the political landscape, he became concerned. The politicians on the left were too noisy and righteous in their fervor to promote abolition. They would polarize the country and the slaveholders could easily exploit these political divisions to maintain their way of life for decades. Lincoln was the consummate realist. If your goal is to end an injustice, you have to aim for results, and that requires being strategic and even deceptive. To end slavery, he would be willing to do almost anything. He decided he was the politician best suited for this cause. His first step was to present a moderate front to the public in the 1860 campaign and after his election to the presidency. He gave the impression that his main goal was to maintain the union in 
and to gradually phase slavery out of existence through a policy of containment. When war became inevitable in 1861, he decided to lay a clever trap for the South, baiting them into an attack on Fort Sumter that would force him to declare war. This made it seem that the North was the victim of aggression. All of these maneuvers were designed to keep his support in the North relatively unified. To oppose him was to oppose his efforts to defeat the South and maintain the Union. The slavery issue slipping into the background. This unified front on his side made it impossible for the enemy to play political games. As the tide of war turned in favor of the North, he gradually shifted to more radical positions stated in the Emancipation Proclamation and his Gettysburg Address. Knowing he had more leeway to reveal his real goals and act on them, leading the North to victory in the war, he had even more room to continue his campaign. In sum, to defeat slavery, Lincoln was prepared to publicly manipulate opinion by concealing his intentions and to practice outright deceit in his political maneuverings. This required great fearlessness and patience on his part, as almost everyone misread his intentions and criticized him as an opportunist. Some still do. In facing an unjust situation, you have two options. You can loudly proclaim your intentions to defeat the people behind it, making yourself look good and noble in the process. But in the end, this tends to polarize the public. You create one hardened enemy for every sympathizer won over to the cause, and it makes your intentions obvious. If the enemy is crafty, this makes it almost impossible to defeat them. Or if it is results you are after, you must learn instead to play the fox, letting go of your moral purity. You resist the pull to get emotional and you craft strategic maneuvers designed to win public support. You shift your position to suit the circumstance, baiting the enemy into actions that will win you sympathy. You conceal your intentions. Think of it as war, short of unnecessary violence. You are called to do whatever it takes to defeat the enemy. There is no nobility in losing if an injustice is allowed to prevail. Static Situations In any venture, people quickly create rules and conventions that must be followed. This is often necessary to instill some discipline and order. But most often these rules and conventions are arbitrary. They are based on something that was successful in the past but might have little relevance to the present. They are often instruments for those in power to maintain their grip and keep the group unified. If this goes on long enough, they become stultifying and crowd out any new ways for doing things. In such a situation, what is called for is the total destruction of these dead conventions, creating space for something new. In other words, you must be the complete lion, as bad as can be. This was how several important black jazz musicians, such as Charlie Parker, Thelonious Monk, and Dizzy Gillespie, responded to the musical conventions that had hardened in the early 1940s. From its more freewheeling earlier days, jazz had become co-opted by white performers and audiences. The sound that became popular, big band, swing, was more controlled and regimented. To make any money in the business, you had to play by the rules and perform these popular genres. But even those black musicians who followed the conventions were still paid considerably less than their white counterparts. The only way around this oppressive situation was to destroy it with a completely new sound. In this case, 
with something that later became known as bebop. This new genre went against all the current conventions. The music was wild and improvisatory, and it became popular. It gave these musicians some space to perform on their own terms and some control over their careers. Now, the static situation was broken and the field was left open to the great jazz innovations of the 1950s and 60s. In general, you must be less respectful of the rules that other people have established. They do not necessarily fit the times or your temperament. And there is great power to be had by being the one to initiate a new order. Impossible Dynamics Sometimes in life you find yourself in a negative situation that cannot be improved no matter what you do. You might find yourself working for people who are irrational. Their actions seem to serve no purpose apart from imposing their power and making you miserable. Everything you do is wrong. Or it could be a relationship in which you are constantly forced to rescue a person. This usually involves types who present themselves as weak victims in need of attention and assistance. They stir up a lot of drama around them. No matter what you do, the need to be rescued keeps reoccurring. You can recognize this dynamic by your emotional need to somehow solve the problem, mixed with your complete frustration in finding any kind of reasonable answer. In truth, the only viable solution is to terminate the relationship. No arguing, no bargaining, no compromising. You leave the job. You leave the person who is tormenting you with as much finality as possible. Resist the temptation to feel any guilt. You need to create as much distance as possible so they cannot inveigle these emotions into you. They must become dead to you so you can go on with your life. Reversal of perspective. The problem with confrontational moments and why we often seek to avoid them is that they churn up a lot of unpleasant emotions. We feel personally aggrieved that someone is trying to hurt or harm us. This makes us wonder about ourselves and feel insecure. Did we deserve this in some way? If we go through a few of these unpleasant moments, we become increasingly skittish. But this is really a problem of perception. In your own inner turmoil, we tend to exaggerate the negative intentions of our opponents. In general, we take conflicts far too personally. People have problems and traumas that they carry with them from their childhood on. Most often, when they do something to harm or block us, it really is not directed at us personally. It comes from some unfinished business from the past or deep insecurities. We happen to cross their path at the wrong moment. It is essential that you develop the reverse perspective. Life naturally involves conflicting interests. People have their own issues, their own agendas, and they collide with yours. Instead of taking this personally or concerning yourself with people's intentions, you must simply work to protect and advance yourself in this competitive game, this bloody arena. Focus your attention on their maneuvers and how to deflect them. When you have to resort to something that isn't conventionally moral, it is just another maneuver you are executing in the game. Nothing to feel guilty about. You accept human nature and the idea that people will resort to aggression. This calm, detached perspective will make it that much easier to design the perfect strategy for blunting their aggression. With your emotions unscathed by these battles, you will grow accustomed to them and will even take some pleasure in fighting them as well. In the ring, our opponents can gouge us with their nails 
or buck us with their heads and leave a bruise. But we don't denounce them for it or get upset with them or regard them from then on as violent types. We just keep an eye on them, not out of hatred or suspicion, just keeping a friendly distance. We need to do that in other areas. We need to excuse what our sparring partners do and just keep our distance without suspicion or hatred. Marcus Aurelius.